This episode is brought to you by Trident Coffee, the veteran-owned brand where every sip inspires you to live life full steam ahead. At Trident, they are more than just coffee. They are storytellers. It's crafted by veterans. Their instant cold brew is perfect for those who serve, those who have served, and anyone who values wellness. Featuring natural ingredients like organic mushrooms, adaptogens, and nootropics, it's more than just a morning pick-me-up. It's your new wellness ritual. Enjoy it at home or on the go, wherever your day takes you. Trident Coffee isn't just about great-tasting coffee. It's about empowering you to be the healthiest version of yourself because great veterans make great citizens. Try their instant cold brew coffee today and taste the freedom of wellness. Remember, when you choose Trident, you're not just choosing coffee. You're choosing a path of connection through health and wellness. Use promo code DTD15 for 15% off your order. In three, two, one, and we're live. Hey, welcome back into the DTD podcast. Man, Ryan, I'm so glad that you could come by and talk to me. We've been talking about this for a while. We had a little bit of trouble today, but I think we're going to get this done just right. So what's been going on, my friend? Uh, today, just weathering this pop-up tropical storm. Uh, kids got done early from school. School's canceled tomorrow, uh, so you know, just dealing with uh, a little North Carolina weather. And, I guess uh, it's that uh, time of the year. Yeah, it is. It is. So <laughs> um, I mean, it just like seemed like a normal rainy day, but Carolina Beach got like 15 inches of rain and it's all flooded and stuff. So you know, it's it is that time of the year. Yeah, well, you know, it could be worse, I guess. You know, I'm glad that you came on here. I want to talk about your career. I want to talk about some stuff that you sustained while you were in your career and then how you handled some stuff at the end of your career and what you've been doing to kind of help veterans move along. Um, I, I think you have a very interesting career. What's interesting to me about it is is that you, you went in, you do some time, you get out, you go to college, you don't do bad in college, but you leave college, go back into the Marine Corps. Um, and so I'm just trying to, you know, kind of figure this out. If, if you missed it, if you, you know, whatever it was that brought you back. But I always want to ask in the very beginning, where does this all come from? Let's talk about your family growing up. Let's talk about, you know, duty to country, all that kind of stuff. If that was around or if this was something that you kind of came up with on your own. Um, you know, growing up, uh, really, um, I wouldn't say I came up with it on my own. My grandfather, one well, of my grandfather served in the Korean War in the Army. Um, he literally went to boot camp without even knowing English. Um, they, him and his brothers came here from Holland and they're like, Hey, you know, one of you needs to fight for a new country. So he went and did that. Um, actually got a couple of bronze stars in Korea. Um, and my other grandfather, he was in the Coast Guard. Um, but really, you know, growing up, it wasn't like, uh, you know, this is like a military, like family type thing, you know, um, like some folks uh, are. Um, you know, for me, I grew up on a dairy farm upstate New York. Um, and it was really, right, I could uh, join the military or uh, farm, as I saw it anyway. Um, my dad asked me when I was a junior in high school whether I wanted to um, uh, go into business with him, farming, and I said no. So we ended up selling our farm, uh, getting a butcher shop. Um, I worked there and uh, went from milking them to, you know, processing them, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice way to put it, right? <laughs> Usually, I'm like, oh, I went from milking them to killing them, right? But, you know, we made milk. And then we made, you know, burger. Um, yeah. So, uh, um, but yeah, for me, I knew that college really wasn't a option just cause I didn't have the, I didn't enjoy school. Um, and I knew that if I committed to being a farmer, that's what I would be for the rest of my life. Uh, and I wanted to try something different. Um, and so the Marine Corps is where I ended up. You know, you say you thought if you said you wanted to be a farmer, that was what you were going to be for the rest of your life. I want to kind of drill a little deeper into that and ask you, being in upstate New York, rural dairy farming, 
did you think that there was a world out there? Were you interested in seeing that world? And that's what was so amazing about the Marine Corps or being in the military to see the world. Or did you just think, you know, if I don't make my move, I won't get out of this area. Uh, I needed to get out of there for myself as, as, as fast as possible. Um, <laughs> uh, mainly because I, it really wasn't a, it wasn't a like, Oh, I want to see the world type thing. I think back then it was more of a very immature and this was, you know, 2000. So pre nine 11, um, it was, a uh, you know, we could join the Marines and, uh, we talked to the army first and they kind of, that guy, that recruiter was a little pushy. So, uh, you know, next day at school, we saw me and my buddy saw the Marine recruiter. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's probably where we need to go. You know, uniforms are better, obviously, but the recruiter is way cooler, uh, with us. So, um, but it really wasn't to see the world. We had this kind of, uh, very immature mindset of like, all right, we'll join the infantry and then we get to kill people. You know. Well, you know, but it's interesting that you say that because you joined that before we were really at war. I mean, you joined the Marine Corps uh, 2000. So this is, you know, a year and a month before, you know, 9-11 even happened. So I'm wondering if it was more than that, maybe in the back of your mind than just killing people. Because, I mean, honestly, we're at a peacetime kind of military then. Of course, you know, they're going to promote that in the commercials and stuff that you can be all you can be for the army. And, you know, the Marine Corps ones are famous, right. the commercials. Slaying dragons, man. Slaying dragons. Exa <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, they, I won't, I won't disagree with you. They had some great commercials on, on both ends of it. Right. But I, I almost wonder if, you know, because in my time that I joined in 94, you joined in 2000, there just wasn't that much going on. So it was almost an adventure to me just to join, to right. get away from where I was, because as, as much as I, you know, got along with my, my family and stuff, I still wanted to get away. I wanted to kind of be on my own. Did you feel yeah. kind of the same sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, like uh, you get tired of your parents telling you what to do and, and so you get other yeah. people to tell you what to do. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Let's show them right. Good thinking. Real good thinking. Yeah. <laughs> right. Real smart. Real smart. Um, no, but uh, you know, really, you know, we grew up watching Rambo and Predator and 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 you know all these f movies. And it was like, yeah, join the you know join the Marines. All right, like they're the first to fight. Right. Uh, they're always doing deployments places. And if someone's going to get, going to get someone, it's going to be the Marines. So let's definitely join the Marines, the infantry, you know, um, you just have that, you know, that, that was kind of what me and my buddy thought when we went in, um, we had no idea that it was going to be 90% complete and utter boredom and jackassery. Um, and then, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, 10%, uh, whole, whole lot of uh, fun, you know, um, and it, not necessarily, but it, yeah, I think mainly the main reason for me was, the, um, you know, just prove that I was a man in my own way. You know? So do you think you're proving it to yourself or do you think you're proving it to everybody else? Because that, that's an interesting point that you bring up to prove that you're a man, because really when you look back at our age now and you think, who the fuck was I proving that? I mean, who am I proving I'm a man to? There's not really anyone around that's sitting up and taking notice at that age. So was it to your family? Was it to you? What what was it? Uh, definitely to myself. Um, I wanted to make my own way in the world um, and not a way that I'd seen, you know, from my dad or my uncles, right? I grew up and, and I'm sure people are going to think this stuff's dysfunctional, but I was telling a story uh, the other day, right? Uh, our idea was fun back in the day. My uncle, he could he could hit you with his vice grips. And these little, every, every farmer's got uh, a pair of vice grips that's about that big. And he could he could slap you with a purple nurple with that thing like he was a ninja. You know what I mean? Like that was our, and that, and, you know, if you ever, if you ever used a, a porta john around uh, anyone who worked with us on any of our farms, me, my dad, uncles, neighbors, you ever went into a porta john anywhere and anybody saw you, it was probably getting tipped over. 
Uh, so these are the guys that, um, that <laughs> these are the guys I grew up with and, and our idea of, you know, fun back then. Uh, but definitely, you know, prove something uh, to myself, uh, to my family. Um, it, not, not as much them, but, you know, myself, a hundred, a hundred percent, you know, uh, test myself, I guess. How were you as a, as a student? Um, cause you said college really wasn't in the future. So it, was it just because you didn't like school? Was it that you were a bad student? What was it that you really kind of marked that off in the beginning? Um, I would say because it bored me. I, I would have much rather been out uh, working on the farm uh, than, you know, being in school. And it it's not that I didn't understand the subjects. Uh, I mean, I had terrible grades. I was like the dude, I was the guy who was always, you know, coaches were always worried about because I had, uh, I was on the line of failing a couple classes because I didn't do homework. Um, and I just didn't really, I just didn't care. Um, there was now there's there there's subjects I excelled in, you know, history definitely is one. I actually did uh, good in English, um, math. I was terrible at, I'm, I'm still, I'm still terrible at math. Um, my art teacher told my mom, I think my freshman year that the only reason why I was passing, uh, was because I was such a nice young man, excited, <laughs> zero artistic ability. So <laughs> I was definitely bad at that one. Um, what a, what a way to inspire. Right. Yeah. And, uh, I just, I get, <laughs> school, school just like was boring to me and I just did not want to be there. Uh, I mean, real, like in all seriousness, my mom got a call two days before graduation and I was like, Oh yeah, your son's going to fail, um, his senior year. Um, and he's not graduating. My mom's like losing her marbles on me. And I'm like, Whoa, mom, mom, I'm, 90 percent sure that i passed like i'm telling you i passed I'm, i think i did really good on my senior paper for english well come to find out the school messed up and not only did i pass but i actually made the honor roll the very last semester of high school so one semester out of all of them i mean i guess that's not too bad um, yeah so i mean i passed and i mean i didn't have very good i didn't take my sats um or any of that so uh off the range i went well, no. I want to ask something real quick. You weren't a great student because it bored you, but you really excelled in your learning in the Marine Corps. So I, I want to know what the difference was for you because, and we'll get into the promotions that you got and stuff, but you really excelled at the training. Um, yeah, it, it interested me. Um, and I wanted to learn that. Um, and Realistic. When I went to college after my first four years in the Marine Corps, I did. I was a great student there. Um, had and did very well. But well, you're an Marine, academic All American. Yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I did very well. Um, I just i I wanted to. I wanted to learn. Um, the I took I took my I took being a Marine and an infantryman in the Marine Corps very seriously. Um, and just embrace that lifestyle um, to the best of my ability. And I realized that I was never, um, you know, like in sports, I was a very good athlete, uh, but I was only the captain. I wasn't the captain of like, say the football team, the basketball team and the lacrosse team. I was the captain of the lacrosse team, not, you know, anything else. Um, you know, I, I, I was not, I've just never been, uh, comfortable being, you know, nothing tr but the best, try to be the best that I can be, you know? Um, so. Well, uh, where you ended up in your Marine Corps career, how were you as a leader being that young? Because like you said, you're the captain of the lacrosse team, but overall, how are you as a leader? Um, you know, when I look back on myself as a young squad leader now, because I was 20 years old when I was a squad leader during the invasion of Iraq, um, I was a very immature leader then um, and probably led more through fear than um, I should have back then. But it was the only way that I knew 
Uh, I mean, we were going into Iraq, you know, for the invasion of Iraq. And I just got, we just got like 10 dudes to our platoon from another unit. So we hadn't done a lot of training together. Uh, my squad, uh, all three of the squads, we got two squad leaders right before we left. So it was kind of, um, you know, we got to do this on the go. Um, so I would say my leadership style back then, it was a little bit more leading through fear um, than other ways, but we still had a successful deployment. So I'll take that. Right. And and I want to get back into that about the leadership, because I think it was a kind of a very strange situation, because when you talk about you're getting new guys in new squad leaders and stuff, pretty much everyone around you was new to war. I mean, yes, we had been there for two years, but pretty much everyone surrounding you was new to war, new to combat, new right. to this kind of lifestyle. But I want to go back for a minute and talk about basic training, because when you go in there and you do basic training, you said, you know, there was boredom followed by fun. Is it everything that you expected it to be? I know that you said that there was boredom, but did you get there and go, man, they sold me a sack of shit here and I'm going to have to figure it out. Or was it everything that you thought it could be? Um, you know, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, I like boot camp. I just like it wasn't insanely hard, uh, but they they do a real they did a great job. I um, you know, like physically it wasn't that hard. You know, I was not, used to waking up early, used to you know walking around the farm and lifting heavy things and doing all that stuff. Um, so that that wasn't it. But they they do a very good job of at making you believe that. There is something that you can do every day that you're going to fail and have to go home for, right? It's like the scariest prospect to anybody at Paris Island is like going to the medical platoon, going to the um, uh, PCP there because you're you're not in good shape, um, you know, or, or failing stuff, right? And they they, always, they did a really good job making you keeping you on edge, so that way you were never kind of like comfortable, you know. Um, so when we, when we left boot camp, I, I distinctly remember a whole bunch of dudes like throwing away a lot of like gear, uh, like, you know, whatever, whatever it was like running shoes, like this and that. I'm like, why, you know, why are you guys getting rid of stuff? Like we're going to need this in a couple of weeks, you know, we're just going home on leave. Um, and so, yeah, I think that it was, I think boot camp was definitely everything I thought it was going to be, um, for sure. Uh, but it didn't, I think it hit me when I checked into the school of infantry that, uh, that I was lied to a bit down there too, you know, (laughs) 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 we were lied to a whole bunch, you know what I mean? Uh, like, you're like, Oh my gosh, everybody's got to be this lean, mean, like fight machine. You know, and all of a sudden we, we check in and I saw my first, I saw the first Marine with no shave shit and he was fat. You know, and I'm like, what in the heck's going on here? Um, This isn't supposed to be the way. (laughs) Well, you you excelled there, too, again, because you're meritoriously promoted to Lance Corporal uh, after the School of Infantry. So as you get this rank, because that's a that's an interesting thing to get, because I think it sets up a whole bunch of different things for your career that a lot of people don't see. So you're young. You're meritoriously promoted, which is a a huge thing in and of itself. And then, two, you see what's actually possible when you work hard. I think a lot of the people that you go to training with don't understand that. They just say, okay, we graduated, we go on, we go to our unit, we do this. There was almost a prize at the end of the road for you before you went on, and you saw, man, if I work hard, this can continue to happen. And it does, I mean, continue to happen to you along your career. Do you think that that sets you on a different path than most of the Marines that were coming out of boot? Um, yeah, it did. Um, because that was the first only one, that was the first and only time I got meritoriously promoted. I got put up on a couple more boards and lost them all for um, whatever reason. Um, but when I hit the fleet as a, as a Lance Corporal already, it kind of put a target on my back um and just because 
there was guys who just, you know, they'd already done a deployment. They'd just gotten promoted to Lance Corporal, right? And there was the whole senior Lance Corporal thing going on. And some new guy who just, you know, gets back from the School of Infantry, this guy's already a Lance Corporal. And, you know, to them, that was a bunch of, a bunch of BS. Um, so I had, a, I had a huge target on my back. And I'm actually, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with that because they set out to kind of make an example out of me, a, a bunch of them. Um, and I was like the tallest and biggest guy. So I'm easy to pick out in a crowd. Um, therefore that kind of was like the, the, the next thing, right? Like let's mess with the biggest dude out there, um, type deal. But, um, me having a target on my back actually came in handy because I was the dude that they were like, Hey, what are the four parts of warring order? I'm like, you know, I don't know. All right. You got two minutes to find out. So I'm like knocking on doors. I'm getting, I got thrashed a lot, hundred percent because of it, but um all that stuff that i learned during that time period is stuff i took with me through my entire career you know and yeah um working hard really for me i just i knew that i was not ever going to be satisfied just being a regular dude in a squad or a team right i wanted to be the squad leader i wanted to be the team leader you know um i didn't i wasn't i didn't want it answer to people except for you know a platoon sergeant or the platoon commander i wanted to have i wanted to have buy-in on everything we're doing and the way to do that was to try to be the best and the smartest and even though i wasn't the oldest right to try to lead by example physically but lead by example in like you know not you know, infantry or recon knowledge and skills and stuff like that you know so that's what i just set out to do is to be the be the best if i could well, and I think it's interesting because you said when you were young and you were, you know, a squad leader that you led more with fear. But I almost think hearing you say that, that it was a different kind of fear. You were fearing to fail in front of all these people that you were trying to prove wrong. Therefore, if you're hard on your guys, you know, yes, it comes off as you're strong arming them and stuff like that. But you're actually trying to get where you need to be. Would you agree with that? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I had a I had a guy in my squad that was thirty seven years old, and he was from Canada. His name was Fraser. Dude could run a machine. He could run a, a, a squad automatic weapon M two four nine like it's nobody's business, and that's all he wanted to do. However, Lance Copa Fraser had stinking hundred fifty thousand dollars in like debt, and uh, I got called in the first sergeant's office, and I'm like, "Why does your marine have? Why are we getting calls from credit card companies?" And, why is he one hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> dude, I'm for one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yes, dude, dude. I mean, like, seriously, just things that you can't make up, right? Like things you can't make up. And I'm like, I'm like, I don't know. First sergeant, like, well, find out, right? Like, it's like, find out, find out what's wrong with your marine. Why is he all jacked up, right? So I'm like, dude, what, what's your deal, right? He's like, dude, I came here from Canada and joined the Marines. Because I didn't know that the debt was going to follow me. I'm like, what do you think? It just magically disappears? Right? <laughs> now they know where to find you. Right? <laughs> you know, you're never going to, you're not going to see a paycheck ever in this lifetime, man. You know? And uh, it was just like stuff like that you can't make up. Um, but I mean, yeah, no, you're you're right. No, I didn't want to, you know, let those guys down. Um, uh, like we did uh, squad leaders course. I went to the infantry squad leaders course in December of... 2002 and then martial arts instructors course of uh of 03 beginning of 03 and then boom we're off to the invasion you know um and no i didn't want to let them down i want to let myself down like this is this is what we came in the marine corps to do and uh we're gonna get put to the ultimate test i had that definitely uh fear of failing myself and fa failing my guys is definitely there's a whole nother level of uh you know well, and I think you had a little bit of leadership behind you already, because before we're talking about the invasion of Iraq, you're already on a Mew, right? You've already done a Mew. Correct. And that Correct. was in support of uh, Operation Enduring Freedom. Correct. So uh, you you got a taste of it, but not a full taste of it. Would you agree with that? Yeah, 100%. And so also, yeah, go I, ahead. Yeah, I also, you know, got a taste for... Um, you know, 
what a bad leader is and what a good leader is on, on you know, that work up, you know, pre 9-11, 9-11, that through that deployment, you know, so there was that, right? Um, you know, I knew what I was striving to be kind of work, what I, I knew what I wanted to work towards as a leader. So um, just I didn't want to be like some of the other squad leaders I'd seen or platoon sergeants and things of that nature. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I talked to Randall Parks a couple of weeks ago, and, and uh, we talked about the difference in 910 on a Marine Corps base and 912 on a Marine Corps base, and it was completely different. Would you agree with that feeling of how the tide kind of changed in uh, one day? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, it was a um, – uh, it was more of a – it was less of the, you know, if, right? Like if we go to war, it was a, it went to when we go to war, because we are going to war. Um, and we were on Fort Bragg when 9-11 happened, and we are chopping to the Mew right after that training exercise. So we knew that we were going to deploy, um, whether it was earlier on time or what have you, we knew we were going, period. So the entire tempo change some 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 guys were you know it, it sobered them up rather quickly and that was going to be my next question to you did you see a market change in guys that worked for you and guys that you worked for yeah yeah there 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 were guys there that were just doing their four years and to to get free college and roll out and go home um there was guys there that we're going to do, you know, a whole career, right? And they, they thought this two years into their career. Um, some, a lot of those guys did not end up doing that. Um, there, but there was a, there was definitely a change in the mentality of people. Uh, some of the guys who did not take, you know, infantry skills as serious, as serious as they should have started to take, that a lot more serious because they understood that the two way firing range is a dangerous place, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to ask how it changed you personally, because I want to know the difference in kind of who you were, you know, we've already talked about when you went to basic and, and, and all of those things. And everyone at that age is kind of, you know, open-minded about the future. They don't really know how does it change for you? Does it harden you up? I know that you you took your job even more serious than you already did, but did you notice anything else about you that changed? Um, yeah. Uh, you know, your country just got attacked. Um, back then, back then it was you know a lot different than right uh, than now. You know, we weren't doing, we couldn't talk. We couldn't talk the way that we're talking right now. You know, cell phones were just starting to be a thing. Um, you know, all this, you know, the media wasn't as insane as it is now. I mean, they were still insane, but just now, you know, they're completely off the reservation. Uh, but, you know, things were just a bit different back then. And, um, you know, the largest attack since Pearl Harbor on United States soil um, that was infuriating. Um, and then it really kind of brought, um, you know, my mentality, right? Like, I'll, you know, I want to get revenge for the lives that were lost on nine 11. Um, I wanted to, uh, not be, you know, stateside. I want to be like in the, in the fray so to speak. Um, and then, I mean, it just, it was, it was so much simpler as a 19 year old infantryman on nine 11, the world was very simple, right? Train to fight, fight, right? Wash, rinse, repeat. Um, very, very easy. And you know, war is, war is, war is very, easy, right? Prep for a mission, conduct mission, debrief mission, rest, refit, wash, rinse, repeat. 
super easy. Um, but my whole man, my whole mentality, you know, changed because it, it was real, right? There, there was no like, oh yeah, we're just going to go in the infantry so we can, you know, shoot some people. It was a boy, a boyish kind of, you know, thing, you know, it was, uh, it was a, people did people of this country wrong and we are now at war and we are going to go root out the people that did this to us and exterminate them. You know? Well, and, and are you looking, when you look back at your life growing up on the farm and everything you did with that, at this point in your life, it's happened. You're, you're in the military. You've already been on a Mew. Um, you're going to go into combat into Iraq. Do you, do you ever sit down and go, this is the meaning of my life right here. This is, you know, the proudest that you've ever been because you worked and you, you've always been a hard worker on the farm and everything like that. But did you finally feel like, yeah, my life has purpose now? Um, you, you know, probably not right then, actually. Um, I don't think that I really had that my life has purpose Probably not even until, probably not even until I got home from Afghanistan in 2009. And it wasn't that my life didn't have purpose. It was, I knew that I wanted to be, right? Like I, I knew I wanted to be a Marine. I knew I uh, wanted to be a um, uh, force recon team leader. Um, that was always my goal ever since working with the uh, force platoon, my first deployment. Um, so I, I, I know that was my purpose. Yes. A hundred percent. Yes. But like, uh, I think, and I say that not till I got home after like 2009, cause it was really then that I really, um, went from wanting to know everything about the job um, and learn everything I could about the job and be the best, you know, recon marine or infantryman that I could be. But then I started to shift into like, not only do I want to know all this stuff, but I also want to, um, teach that mentor, you know, young Marines and doing this. And then it was, then it really hit home for me that it was a, it was my, this was my like purpose, you know, this is what I enjoy doing, right. It's my, my life. Right. And, and I, I guess to, to drill down even more, what I was saying by asking that is I understand about the purpose and everything, but when you look back at your life on the farm and then you look there, you're a part of history now. Like you yeah. have been a part of a huge portion of history. And we talked at the very beginning about being on the farm and being in New York and, you know, rule and all of that kind of stuff. And now just a few years removed, you are part of, world changing history. Uh, and I guess that's what I mean by the purpose. Do you ever understand at that age or is it still until like 2009 that you understand kind of the breadth of the expansion of what you're doing? Um, that the purpose, that piece of it, uh, when we came home from the invasion, I don't think, um, after that Mew I did after 9-11, not so much, but after we came home from the invasion, definitely we were like, hey, this is, this is part of, this is history. You know, this is going to be like the, how they talk about in 10 years will be how the kids talk about the, uh, the Gulf War, you know, um, or how we, uh, we talk, talked about the Gulf War, you know what I mean? So to speak. Um, so yeah, definitely like, yeah, we definitely, you know, we're in the history books that, I definitely realize that um, for sure. And if we focus in on the invasion, is there anything from that deployment that stands out to you? Anything that, you know, whenever you think back to that time in your life that always seems to pop up? Um... <laughs> I, I can tell there is by the way you looked while I was asking. Yeah. So uh, just because it's a funny thing, I guess. Um, me and this guy, Naha, when they pulled us out of Iraq, they brought us in to do a post-deployment health assessment. And both of us wrote on there, what about Gulf War Syndrome? Right? Question mark. Um, right? And we are the only two guys who are staying in company formation. We're like, Coop, Naha, get up here. And then we had to go to medical and we're like, and they're like, what is this? And I was like, it's a legit question, right? Like, what about Gulf War Syndrome? 
Did you guys ever figure out what uh, what caused that? The first Gulf War? Because it's like 20 <laughs> years later, guys. Like we haven't figured that out yet. Like I, you know, I kind of want to know. I want it to be documented, right? And they're like, "Listen, you're not leaving unless you scribble that out, right? Like fill out a new paper." So like, I'm like, I'd rather go home than sit here and hash it out with you, pal. So you know, I just filled out a new paper. Um, that's just, I for some reason that's what I was thinking about when you were asking me that question at first. Um, but um, other. Um, Let's stick on that for just a minute because you bring up a really good point there. I mean, it's it, it it's funny the way you said it. You know, we still haven't figured that out from 20 years ago. And I can see you saying, like, look, I coughed this morning. Does that mean I have it? Or, you know, the but the whole point of them saying and and it shows where we were at that time period. And I almost wonder if it's changed now. And I once again, I speak from the law enforcement perspective. But how far have we come that they told you? Scratch it out or you're not going home. Oh, man, I, I could still see that happening in some places. Um, now, as far as we've come, right, we've come a long way, a long, long way, because now, because of all the technology, you can write, I mean, you can do dang, you know, they call it, like I, you can do IG complaints, you know, inspector general complaints are via off your computer. Right? It's not an in-person thing anymore. Um, and ICE complaints, you can do all this crazy stuff. So it's come a long way on that. Um, there And there's still not uh, come very far in other ways because they're like, hey, line up for shot call. And you're like, didn't I just get that vaccine like last week? Like, yeah, yeah, you'll get it again. Bam. You know, get smoked with a, the Hep B like for the 30th time. Um it's very but, important you get your hep B shot. Right, yeah. You know, I mean, there's like, there's there's certain areas where we've like made all this progress. Um, and a lot of, and then sometimes kind of like at this expensive, you know, like what? You know, everything, everything, all of, all these things are in place because something bad happened, right? People are growing third, you know, nuts because they breathe in smoke from a burn pit and sniff batteries for eight months of their dang uh, deployment, you know, like, Hey, didn't anybody think that was a bad idea when the smoke was rolling right in these people's tents for, you know, every day, but I don't know. Well, let's talk about when you get back from the invasion. Um, next you go over to Okinawa, correct? Yes. In so sure. when you go over there, you're promoted over there to Sergeant, right? You were correct. a corporal during the invasion. Now you're being promoted to Sergeant. Yep. Um, and you're starting to see, I think, now you have uh, at least one pump, if you want to count the mew under there, two, two pumps uh, underneath you. You're in support of Joint Special Operations in the Philippines, so you're really starting to see this kind of small, very small world open up. And when you're looking around, are you changing your worldview at all? Are you focused in on, you know, what you want to do? Because you've said a couple times the recon position and stuff like that are you changing kind of your world view of this is what you want to do forever now um on that deployment um so i almost re-enlisted on that deployment actually to be a drill instructor um i don't know what i was thinking on that one but um and my package came back like crazy fast and i was like yeah i'm gonna think about that um <laughs> <laughs> you know like i mean like i i mean i straight up boogered up after the mew right it's like i was gonna go to the sniper and dock and like oh if you go to the sniper and dock you gotta extend for you gotta extend like 18 months or whatever it is right so you can go to sniper school and all this other hunk of bunk and i'm like no nah, i'm not doing that and then i'm like for the uh force uh for the force recon select or uh, screener um Isn't that, that even like, longer Oh, uh, they were like, you got to extend for two years. I'm like, I'm not extending. I'm not doing this. What the hell? And, you know, uh, which is bull crap because my buddies that went to both places, neither of them, uh, none of them had to extend because the invasion ended up happening. So a bunch of dudes were like literally in the middle of sniper school. And they're like, all right, you guys are good. Boom. Um, they skipped like, I think the last two weeks or something like that out of the school. And we deployed and a couple of my buddies that went over to force company, they didn't end up having to extend because they ended up going to the invasion and deploying and doing all that stuff. Um, 
you know, and they're like, okay. I was like, yeah, maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll be a drill instructor. You know, that'll, that'd be, you know, good for my career and all that stuff. And, and then I, I was just like, what? Our unit was just, our unit was just like, I, there, it was just, I was like, no, absolutely not. I'm not reenlisting. Like this is done now down the Philippines, down the Philippines. I had some of the most fun I've ever had in the Marine Corps. Cause I was, it was me, uh, my Lieutenant was down there and then my squad. And so I had FaceTime with the Sodaf major every day. Uh, he was a Citadel football player. We lifted weights together. I went to dinners with him and stuff and rewrote the security SOPs or the convoy SOP down there. Cause they just moved into a new base and all that. And, uh, uh, got along famously with those guys and the SF guys there. I mean, it was freaking great. We trained with them, um, did a whole bunch of stuff, and um, it was just fantastic time. Um, but I still left there and went back to two six. Right, like I told the SF major, like, man, you know, I think I'm gonna join Special Forces because you guys got the life. Like, this is awesome. He's like, no, nah, you shouldn't do that. The Marines need guys like you, right? And, now I'm thinking back on that. I'm like, man, you what know the what? fuck did he mean by that? And, and which, which, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. but but you know what? I can't even talk crap about that guy because when I was out of the Marine Corps, I went over the recruiting station to the Army and I put in a pa uh, X-ray package to be a a, a damn X-ray. Right, and I did all these waivers to keep my rank, did everything like swore in and all that other stuff. They wouldn't give me a bonus um, because I was prior service um, Marine. I keep my rank, but they wouldn't give me a bonus. And guys at that time off the street were getting like 30 grand. And then re guys re enlisting in SF, they're getting like 90, 100 grand. Right. And they didn't want to give me anything. So I was like, you know what, man, go pound sand. So then I went and joined the Marine Corps, which, you know, what, honestly shows me how like short sighted I was because I'd have been like a freaking E7 and like real quick. And I would have gotten way more pay than I did in the Marine Corps, but you know, no big deal there. But well, um, let, me, anyway. let me ask you something about that. I, I ask you if this is what you decided that you wanted to do for the rest of your life. And the reason I asked that was because once you get back from the Philippines, you discharge from the Marines. And so I wonder you go to college, but that doesn't last very long. Um, like two years about that you're out. Yeah, two two and, like school years, eighteen months or so, like yeah. years. And I'm yeah. sure that the whole time you're thinking about the Marines, it doesn't leave you that quickly and then come back that quickly. It's got to be floating around there. Yeah, yeah, I did the reserves in there too. Um, right. And yeah, and guy, guys at that reserve unit literally were like, "Hey, uh, if you love active duty so much, you should just go back there because we don't want you here." Well, well um, you were on a terrorism yeah. unit, correct? Yeah. Yeah. They had just turned over, uh, they were headquarters for tanks. They just turned them over into an infantry unit. So it was, um, when I was there, like just training them to be infantrymen and some of them were going to the school of infantry and coming back. And it was just kind of a, you know, restructuring time for them, I guess would be the best way to say it. But we went and trained up at, um, Fort drum a couple of times. Um, which is miserable, by the way, in the middle of the winter. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I was doing that. I mean, no, it, do it doesn't leave you. Um, I guess, you know, for me, I had a son. I had my son at that time. He lived in New York. Um, I always wanted to play, um, you know, in the, well, in the Marine Corps, in all the military, really, right? You talk to all these guys like, oh, I could have played Division One football. Well, you go to out to like, you go out to, uh, uh, you know, platoon PT, and that dude can't even catch a football. He don't even know what a football <laughs> looks like, but he could have been a Division One athlete. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I was like, you know what? I want to go play lacrosse in college, so I'm going to go do that and, um, you know, and see how it goes. Um, and I did good. It was great. It was a good experience. But to me – you know, I definitely realized, you know, like it doesn't leave you. Um, I still had, I still had goals that I wanted to accomplish and meet in the Marine Corps. And um, for me, I, I, you know, my path was that to be a Marine. So that's why I went back in. So did you think 
that that was a bad idea that you got out? Like when you look back on it, did you go, oh, that was a horrible idea? Or did you think, okay, it's a learning experience. I know now what it's like on the other side of the fence. Let's go back in where I know what I really want to do. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't regret, I didn't, I mean, I don't regret it at all. Um, I think that that was a very, um, I think that was a very key part of my development as a leader, actually. Um, and as a Marine, um, uh, because I probably needed, a um, a chill out, um, not like, I mean, like, not like mentally, but I need to be around some, uh, uh, other people, um, kind of to find, uh, I mean, I think it helped develop me into like a better leader, right? Cause I was captain of the lacrosse team. Um, and uh, I dealt with a, I mean, a lacrosse team is as close to infantrymen as you can get in the civilian world, really. Anyways, they're a bunch of miscreants. Um, but I think that my college experience help, um, one helped me do better intellectually, um, in the Marine Corps as in when it came to like writing like awards or, um, briefs and stuff like that. Um, help me kind of relax um, and shift my leadership style. Um, I've always, I'm, I mean, I was still aggressive when I went back in. And if you ask anyone who's known me, they'll always tell you that I was very, very aggressive. And um, I'm just an aggressive person. But um, help me kind of just focus on the mentorship, I guess, part of leadership, um, I think. So let me ask you a question then, though. When you go back, of course, you learn that, how to write. You you learn some stuff about yourself. I guess the big portion I would like to ask you, though, is when you get back, you've been in the invasion of Iraq, you've done your military service, and you come back and see these people, college people, and it happens a lot in college. There's a lot of free thinkers. There's a lot of liberal thinking. When you get into school, do you do you start to wonder, like, man, I fought for this country and, and this is what I hear on the backside of it because you hear a lot of left leaning or people that aren't necessarily backing up the military or patriotic or however you want to put it. Once you get there, did you see any of that? And did that ever cross your mind? Like, man, I, I fought for this and I got to put up with this bullshit now. Yeah. Um, so I had a teacher in my psych one one class who actually was a Marine as well. He's a Korean war vet fraudulently enlisted when he was, I want to say 15 or 16. Um, but this guy hated Bush. I mean, like he didn't think we should have been in Iraq. I mean, this dude was as far on the other side of the spectrum uh, as you could be, you know, and this guy was a, a Marine too. And a, and a, a dang Korean war vet. So that really blew my mind at the time. <laughs> um, really blew my mind. Uh, and he and I, he and I would be in it. We would spend an hour in his class, like going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And, uh, one time this girl was like, Hey, professor, can you actually like teach us about psychology? Right. And stop arguing with him about the like war in Iraq and, uh, geopolitics and this and that and the other thing. And he literally told her, he's like, get the F out, get out. And that's it. And she got the, got the- <laughs> <laughs> so like i mean that just blew that just blew my mind right i'm like man we got a quiz on on uh, the you know next class i we didn't say anything about psychology like i don't even know what this guy is where we're going uh right now and you know like we, we need to get to the freud part of things you know um but there i did encounter a whole bunch of that and um it just <sighs> it was rough let me, I'm going to say this because I took this class intro, uh, uh, introduction to, to writing or no introduction to literature. That's what it was. And us and another class paired up and both of the professors, um, were lesbians. So, and it's not clearly a very other end of the spectrum, uh, of me, but they both like liked me. Like we had, we both had, um, uh, or we would have good discourse. And I don't know if that's because I was 22 or 23 at that time. And the rest of the students are 17, 18 years old or what, what have you, but I could actually have 
good discussion with them, even though we would agree to disagree or just flat out disagree. Um, so some of the, the professors were like very professional. Some of the students, you know, on the other hand, I may or may not have told them like where to, you know, to, like, hey, just shut the F up, you know, like seriously, you don't, you don't know what you're talking about. Like your worldview is very skewed. You know, like you don't understand how the world works outside of this country. Well, and don't you think that's probably why you could, you were able, not just because you were 22 or 23, you could have that discourse because you had seen the world. You had been open to more than just school. You had seen yeah. how things really work. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's a hundred percent. I mean, that, that's probably a lot of the problem right now is that people just have not traveled outside of this country anywhere. You know, you go to your, go to the, for, go to Europe. Anywhere, go to a first world country in Europe. In three weeks, if you stay there for two or three weeks, you will be thankful to come back to this country because it is that much more awesome than there, you know? Anyway. Yeah, you know, I, I think though, to kind of tack on to that, having that military experience, having that other side of things, because you, even if you break it down to the simplest level, even going to basic training, spending your summers or however you did it to go because I was split option. So I went my junior year between my junior and senior year to basic. And then my AIT was my senior year after my senior year, you just kind of look at things a little differently. Um, but I think that it can also be a, a hindrance too. If you can't learn to kind of open up and take in that education experience too. And I'm sure you saw that happen where, People are just like, nope, it's this way and that. And you really have to be open when you're in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think I did a, I did a, I, I did a probably a better job than people thought that I might. Um, because at the end of the day, um, <laughs> I just found that, you know, I guess it's the, you know, it's easier to catch the flies with honey than with vinegar. Um, you know what I mean? So, uh, learn speaking, uh, you know, talking to some of these kids, um, by the time you're done talking to them, they don't realize that you did not agree with them at all. Um, just the, your delivery, right. Working on your delivery, um, is kind of what, uh, I had to learn there as well, because, you know, some, you know, they're lost in the sauce. So. Lost well, let's talk city. about, yeah, well, let's talk about you going back in. So you decide to go back in now as you reenlist March, 2006, second reconnaissance battalion, uh, reconnaissance training platoon. Um, you're right back in the fray of it. And this is actually where you wanted to be. So how did you set that up when you came back in? Because you were an infantryman before you always wanted that special operations, the recon route. How do you do that coming back in and how do you make sure that you get to where you're going to go? Uh, literally, uh, I made that happen because the recruiting station was across the street from my apartment and I was friends with the recruiter and I was like, Hey, uh, I want to go back in. This is what I want to do. I want to go to recon. And he's like, uh, it, we had to play kind of like hardball. Um, I don't have spaces for that. You know, we're not really taking um, prior service. I'm like, all right, well, let's work this out. Cause I also know that he wanted to be rookie of the year too, cause he was a new recruiter, right? So like, I'll help you be rookie of the year, right? Give me what I want. I don't want to leave till June. I want to go back in right now. Cause I wanted to reenlist, start collecting a paycheck and then uh, finish out lacrosse season. And then go down uh, to Campbell June, and uh, I think it was like May or June of that year. Um, and so I was like, "Look, if you get me to do this, and we do it now, you'll be rookie of the year, et cetera, et cetera." Um, so we made it happen, reenlisted, and then I would just kind of send perspective. I would just talk to people at school, send them some perspective people, and I got orders to um, to rip now. I was supposed to have done a screener, um, but I did not do that. And I have no idea how that happened, but I showed up down there uh, to the second recon battalion um, with orders, like straight to a 
to to a company and they're like yeah you're not an 0321 so you're going the rep so and you were a sergeant at the time because you got to keep your rank correct i was absolutely so let's talk about that because we talked in the very beginning about being a lance corporal when you come out of the school of infantry and everyone's got a target on your back now you've left the military and people really don't give a shit about what you did in the past and you came back in you got to keep your rank and you got to go to recon when all these other guys have been fighting to get into those positions. And it's a very dog eat dog to get into those positions. Same kind of thing happened to you again. Is there a target on your back? Are they watching for you and saying, we don't know, or is your past speaking for you? And it makes a difference for you. Um, there in rip, it's kind of like a full metal jacket where, you know, uh, Hartman's like here, you are all equally worthless. Like that's how, that's how rip is. Um, whether you're a PFC or a sergeant, um, you're all, you know, got your green silkies and your name stencil on your shirt the same way. Um, and you don't wear rank uh, in rip. So um, you, there you're all equally worthless, basically. Um, now, I would say that m me being a sergeant, actually, I mean, it, it didn't really help me um, because I had very high PT scores. I was in RIP for like two weeks, um, and but we'd never been to the pool. And they're like, hey, you're going to go up to ARS, uh, to Amphibious Reconnaissance School. And I was like, hey, you know, I have not done a screener yet. Like, we haven't been in the pool. You know, like, I know I can swim. I know I can do this. I can do that. But I've never done a crossover. Uh, which is like 25 meters uh, in camis, no boots. Uh, under you go down, go under, you can't, you know, come up for 25 meters, right? We call it the crossover. Um, I'd never done that. And they're like, yeah, you'll be good. And so I went up the uh, four story and then um, I ended up failing the, the, failing the screener, um, which was, um, probably the lowest I one of, one of the lowest feelings I've ever felt in my entire life because I was standing on the pool deck uh did the swim uh did the I can't remember if we tread water next uh, for 30 minutes or not maybe we did um then you do the crossover um but I only made it like 12 12 meters and I came up and I literally remember seeing uh now a guy who's a good friend of mine Mario Real he was a uh, uh, he was an instructor Right. And I came up and I was like, oh, fuck. Right. And he's like, yeah, oh, fuck's right. Go back and try it again. And I failed, you know, and um, so that was very humbling for me. And my uh, another guy who's now a very, very good friend of mine, um, Chad Ramsey, he was the uh, RIP platoon sergeant. He was like, hey, man, he's like, you're a sergeant. Why did you just fail the screener? And I was like, I've never done a screener, Connie. And I told your staff that they told me I'd be good. And here I am. And I blew it. Right? Uh, I've never done it before. And, you know, basically do with me what you will. And he told me, he was like, you're going to go back to the rip here and be a recon Marine. So uh, I went back down the rip. And a couple months later, I went to BRC and I corrected that issue so um, i want to ask though do you you almost can't help but blame partially blame the guys that you told that because you knew that going into it i probably won't pass this thing and, and i'm sure that has something to do with the mind games of it but at any point do you pass that off or do you take it completely on the chin and you take blame for it completely uh you know I definitely told those guys that I had never done a screener. I'm not going to pass too much blame on those dudes um, for a couple of reasons. Um, but I should have gone and, and told, you know, I should have gone and told Chad, like, hey, you know, like I've never done a screener. Um, however, um, it's a very important part of my story, you know, and, uh, a very important part of my career. Um, 
because I was that close, you know, to, to going back to the grunts. Um, and that was a feeling that I never wanted to have ever again in my entire career. Um, like I was going to get launched from something like you're right on the cusp of being able to do something that you've always wanted to do. And then, you know, you're about, now you're about to get launched out of there and you're never going to get to do it. Um, that, that is a, a feeling that you just can't replicate. Um, so it's definitely a, a part of my story. And, um, do I blame them? I mean, come on, man, them guys should have known. Um, but again, they were like, Hey, you got it. You'll be good. And the cockiness, right. The arrogant side of me was like, all right, those dudes said, I'll be good. I'll be good. I'll get it. You know, maybe I won't be the best at it, but I'll get it. Well, you know what? I sure didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I sure the didn't. reason, right. Well, the reason I asked that is because when you look back on it and, and I'm going to ask a very pointed question to you. You knew that that was coming up. You knew you had to do it, right? Yep. Did you ever go to the pool and practice it? Sure didn't. Any sure reason didn't. why? That's why, I can't, and that's why I can't pass it on them. You know, because um, I didn't go practice it either. I just, I just took it as a. I got. I, I will. I'm a. I'm a physical specimen, and I'm running a seventeen. Right, I'm running. I'm running a seventeen forty-five three mile. I'm doing like twenty, three four pull ups, uh, over a hundred crunches. Um, my ruck run times are amazing. I'll go and smoke that out of the water too. Underwater <laughs> is very different world. A oh, very yeah. different world. I definitely didn't. So, <laughs> um, yeah, no, and I didn't. I didn't practice, and that's one hundred percent on me. So. so when you go back, you go back to rip. Is it? Im I know that it was the lowest point, but I'm talking as you go back and you're meeting up with these people. How do you face them? How do you do that every day? Because they know you were sent over there to do that. Everyone thought you were going to pass, and then you come back. Can we talk about that kind of feeling? And I mean, you're uh, brand new back into the military, and that's a kick in the nuts to be right back in. Um, you know, honestly, uh, no, I didn't really. It, you know, it's like, oh shit, you failed. Uh, you failed the screener. That sucks. Like, I don't want that to happen to me, right? And there's like, and then there was a bunch of guys that I'm still really good friends with who weren't the best kind of like me, more like a snowplow in the water in the pool. Um, that we're like, we're going to the pool and doing crossovers and not just camis, but in sweatpants and sweatshirts because there's more drag there. Um, so I didn't really get looked at differently. It was more of like a Oh man, that sucks. Um, we don't, we don't want to be the dude that doesn't pass the screener and, you know, uh, have to stay and rip longer. Cause there was dudes who would be in rip for like a year. There's guys who'd be in rip for like a month. There's guys that'd be in rip for a year. You want to get, you want to get out of there as soon as possible. Do you look at yourself differently? I know you said that it was the lowest point in your career. Do you look at yourself differently? Do you ever look around and go, maybe I don't belong where I thought I did? Um, no, that I never, that, okay. that, that thought never crossed my mind ever. Um, so let me ask you then, how do you write it in your mind? Because there had to be a point. Cause if you say that thought never crossed your mind, there had to be a, a legitimate literal flip of the switch to shut that off and let you continue forward. This episode brought to you by max belts. Guys, are you looking for a perfect accessory to wear every single day for every single scenario? Well, you've come to the right place. We all know that nothing stands up to wear and tear like a good leather belt. If you're looking for the toughest leather belt on earth, then you've come to the right place. Max belts. They're handcrafted in the USA by veterans who are serious about their craft. And if you're looking for a belt that's tough enough for your active lifestyle and help support those who've given so much to our country, look no further than Max Belts. It's the toughest belt on the planet. It's a perfect solution for casual or dress wear and ideal for utility and firearm carry. It's the highest caliber of American craftsmanship, and it also positively impacts our military charity partners. Once again, Max Belts, you can't go wrong with them. I wear them every day. They're the toughest belt on earth. And you can find all of this and so much more 
at maxbelts.com. They're only, okay, so the only time that that ever crossed my mind when I was, I was sitting on the, standing on the pool deck uh, after I got, I had to get out of the pool and I was standing there. And that's the only time where I was like, oh man, maybe this is not going to happen for me. Uh, and then Chad Ramsey was like, you will be a recon brain. And I never, never again in my brain, was it ever going to be anything else other than that? Um, you know, like when I was at BR, when I was at the, uh, basic reconnaissance course out in Coronado and I was standing on the pool deck there, right. They're like, all right, crossover time, right. I'm like, all right, this is the last crossover that I ever have to do in my entire career. Right. Cause this is the one that makes, will make me a recon ring if I freaking pass this course. Well, I can tell you right now that wasn't the last um, crossover. <laughs> <I ever did. laughs> that wasn't even that wasn't even like the 999th to the last crossover I ever did. <laughs> Jumped on crossovers all kinds of ways after that, with my camis wrapped around my hands, with around my feet, with my hands tied behind my back, yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, so that was definitely a lie I told myself, but. Um, that little that little smidge of doubt was there when I was standing on the pool deck, and after that, it was not ever there in my brain again because that wasn't failure was not going to be an option. So you pass it, and uh, I guess you move over Charlie Company Second Reconnaissance, and you're actually a team leader there. Correct. And so you're doing everything that you've always wanted to do. So how are you feeling in life? Because the big thing's about to switch on you. There's a big thing that's getting ready to happen, but how are you looking at life right now? Uh, great. I mean, uh, like life was great. Um, we had both of our, both, uh, my platoon and my sister platoon, both of, um, our platoon sergeants were, uh, special operations training group instructors and love CQB and shooting. So we did a lot of that. Um, all the guys that were in, uh, kind of in my class from the basic reconnaissance course and the, uh, ARS course that kind of left a week after we did for the, on the East coast, we were all in Charlie company and a lot of guys who had just became recon Marines that I was in rip with, and at school with, we were team leaders and assistant team leaders, um, which is very rare to have anything like that happen. So, um, and there was a couple team leaders that were left over um, from the previous deployment, but mainly it was all of us. Um, so we were having a great time. Um, life was great. Life was fun. Uh, we're training hard. Uh, we're partying hard, uh, you know, um, on the weekends and whatnot. But, um, we had a we had uh, we had a good company and uh, Charlie company. That's your military life. How's your family life? Um, so I had a son and a daughter at that time. Um, was not married to their mother. Um, so pretty much any time that I had off, I would go to you know see my kids, family, um, you know, like family, mom, dad, and all that. Um, they were all good um yeah they're all good recovering actually i would say because um uh, that butcher shop that we had had kind of um went under and my dad ended up um he's now a vice president at a very large road construction firm in new york and my mom was a nurse so they kind of went left the butcher shop and went to you know um to back to work in their, their normal, um, or normal job for my mom, which she's always been a nurse since I was a kid. And my dad, he, you know, dipped his uh, feet into another world and has done well there. Um, my kids, uh, you know, anytime that I was not, um, tra you know, anytime I had a three, four day weekend or leave, I was going to see my kids. Um, so in that, in that respect, family life was, um, as good as it could be for, you know, at that time. Are you looking for anything? Are you looking for family stability? Cause you know, you have a lot of guys that, that get married because they don't want to go do something and not have been married, not have a family. Are you, since you already have kids, you're already in the job that you want. You're not really in that predicament. Is there ever a point where you look and you go, 
well, I'd like to have a family and I'd like to have this, or are you just looking at, I'd like to do this and be a good dad of my kids? Um, so I had a girlfriend, oh, who's not my wife, uh, by the way. <laughs> Glad it worked out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, man, I've uh, been uh, dating her um, for a, a long time. Like most guys give their wife uh, one deployment test before they marry her, and mine kind of got the, the two or three deployment test. Um, uh, but yeah, I was dating my, uh, now wife at the time. So, and yeah, there, there was that, um, you know, I want to have a family, um, you know, I, like, you know, quite honestly, and she's heard me like say this, but like my priority, unfortunately, not, my priority was the job, um, the job and my men, um, so, and, you know, focusing on my career, my career, I guess, to, to put it selfishly, but focusing on the job, the mission, uh, my men, um, that was more of the priority than um, my family, even though I did, you know, like I said, take those weekends and vacations and go spend time with them. But other than that, it was very much focused on, um, you know, the job. When you say that, though, you almost pause and I don't think the word is a shame, but you pause and you almost seem to be hesitant to say that the focus was on the job. Yeah, because now I would do it differently. Um, so, um, and what I would do, I would balance. I think I would um, maybe spend some of my time uh, a bit more wisely than I did. Um, and not get right. The, the, the Marine Corps goes on with or without you. Um, you know, I mean, you're a number, right? That's just, that, that's just the way that it is. Um, and you get very focused on, on, um, you know, very focused on the, you know, like I said, the mission, um, what's, you know, and, and the, whether that's the unit's mission, what, whatever that is, you get very focused on that. It's easy to, to not think about what's more important. Um, and quite honestly, family is more important than the Marine Corps. Um, I would just, I would just do things a little bit more, uh, I would do things a little differently. Um, you know, spend a little bit less time at work, um, spend a little bit more time with my kids. And, um, you know, and, and not get wrapped around the axle by the, the, I don't even know what you want to call it of the, of the Marine Corps, you know, um, cause there's the so machine much, of the Marine you know, Corps the machine. Right. Right. So let me ask you then, and, and I'm, I'm sure I know the answer, but when you look back on it now and I'm talking about right now, not back then, was it worth it? Yeah. Okay. It's yeah. interesting, though, that you say that, that it was worth it. But in the other talk, you say, I would have done things differently. That's yeah. why. Yeah. And I get and I get what you're saying, but I guess, I guess like I'm also a, a hypocritical and a hypocrite and a liar because I would say, yeah, if I go back now, I would change it. But I also know myself. Right. Like right now, if I put a uniform on, we had to go to Afghanistan to run operations. Yes, I would do things much differently. Um, I may not, you know, do things a little bit differently. However, uh, if I went back right now, knowing what I know, I also know myself enough to know that I wouldn't do anything different. But you almost, you said you know yourself, you almost can't stop that. If right. that's you, at right. some point, there's going to be a breakdown. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. And you're going to have to go one way or the other on the road. Yeah. The the reason uh, setting all that up to move into the injury that you have in the rollover. I I feel at this part of your career that it it really changed the trajectory and it really didn't. And I know that seems very complicated to say it like that. But do you think at any point you it really changed who you were as a Marine and as just a man. Yes, it did. hundred percent. It, it changed me. 
Um, I I would definitely say that uh, it brought me down a few pegs and reminded me that I, I was, um, you know, uh, I don't want to say mortal, right? But like, like I said, we were having a great time uh, in that platoon, in that company. Um, and like, it just seemed like we were unstoppable in some ways. Um, and again, it was another point in time in my life where, you know, doctors are telling me like, Hey, you're never going to be a recon Marine again. This not, you're not, you're not going to do that anymore. Like you're not jumping out of planes. You're not humping packs. Uh, you're not doing any of that stuff. It's not happening. Um, and so I set off to prove them wrong. Um, it was a, it was a, I mean, an insanely low point in my life because I was sitting home while all my uh, guys and friends and, and, and everybody's deployed and I'm just sitting home, uh, you know, with my, with a back brace on and, a, and a, my leg up and, you know, um, broken and, you know, eating pills and, you know, drinking booze and just feeling mighty sorry for myself. It was, it was rough. So let's talk about what actually happened. So everyone kind of understands what happened to you in, in the rollover. And I really want to get into this because I, I think that this changed you almost like down to the cellular level, this, this accident. Yeah. So we were uh, convoying back out to a training area and we were a second less vehicle probably, I don't know, probably five or six vehicles in the convoy, but, uh, convoy broke right. And my driver cut half left and I was like, Hey, uh, turn right, turn right. And we weren't going very fast, probably 25 miles an hour or so, maybe a smidge faster. And he cut right, hit some soft sand or something. And, uh, we were in an up armored Humvee, which are pretty top heavy. And it rolled the Humvee over, uh, two or three times. Um, I remember the first rollover, but I don't remember anything else after that. And when I woke up, we were, I was laying in the desert and broke my femur, uh, broke my back, fractured my forehead, got some teeth went through my lip, broke my nose in like five spots. Um, so uh, we were laying there and then had to, uh, <laughs> uh, obviously everyone came to the, to the, to the scene and uh um doc cut my pants off the other doc uh doc beard i'm telling you buddy he'll pal uh he put my leg in traction which he swore was going to feel better which it did not feel better um <laughs> my first <laughs> oh man beard i love you buddy but man that hurt um <laughs> My first sergeant, I have a tattoo on my back. Uh, it's a, you know, tramp stamp. Uh, it says pain is candy. And my first sergeant's sitting there asking me like, hey, is pain candy now? Is pain <laughs> candy now? And I'm like, no, it's not. It's really not. Um, yeah, so I got medevaced out of there, 29 Palms, and uh, uh, stayed there for about 10 days before I got flown home. So I got to ask you something about this injury and about – the recovery of it. And I want to phrase it to you in kind of comparing both worlds. You've always wanted to be a recon Marine. You're one, you're training. This accident, all of those injuries happen to you. You have to recover while all your buddies deploy. They do all these things. Does it make it even worse to you in your brain that it's a training accident and not in Afghanistan or Iraq or doing something that, you know, like we talked about where you're part of changing history. Does that ever cross your mind? Like I can't even go out in style. Like it's, it, does that make any sense? Oh yeah. That makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> and people that I'm like, Oh yeah, you know, I was in a Humvee rollover and this is what happened. They're like, Oh, did that happened in Iraq or Afghanistan. I'm like, Nope. That happened to nine palms. Um, yeah, no, that, that, that thought the whole, like it just happened to me, um, you know, in the United States, by same country, um, definitely was a, like a thought, 
right? Then there's also the other thought of, I'm really glad that this didn't happen in country because you're laying there with a, a broken back and a, a broken femur and you're getting shot at and all that other stuff. Like that just is a sh- miserable, shitty freaking day, even shittier than it already is. You know what I mean? So there is that other side of that uh, coin as well. Um, but no, it definitely, that definitely was a thought um, for sure. Is the thought of missing out or as they say, the fear of missing out, is that going through your mind too? The, the, the FOMO? Oh, hundred yeah. percent. hundred percent. All the dudes that I'd gone through RIP and BRC with and, you know, like they're on their first the deployment as recon Marines. And I didn't get to go to it. Oh man, that definitely, that definitely was like, uh, you know, you know, knife in the knife in the old chest too. You know what I mean? Um, so that definitely was another, definitely another angle of it. When you look at the situation and I want to compare then to now, when you look at the situation, then, do you see anything good coming from it? Do you ever see your life getting back to normal? And then now when you look at it, do you go, man, that was crazy that I even thought that way because of how you know you are? Um, it definitely, that accent definitely changed the trajectory of my career and my life. Um, uh, and uh, it definitely, it definitely did. Um, however, I'm not, I mean, I won't say that I'm glad for it, but what ended up happening to me post injury recovery in my career from then on all is a part of it. You know, um, it's when I recovered, I went to Elf company and we ended up to deploy in Afghanistan. Um, and had I not <clears throat> had that injury, I probably would have gone a, a, a different route and not had the rest of the career that I ended up having. So, I mean, like, you know, the, the whole adage of, you know, everything happens for a reason is kind of played out a little bit, but, um, it definitely changed my, it changed my career. It definitely changed me, but, um, I'm ex- I mean, I'm, I accept it, you know, um, my body has never been the same. Uh, my run time's definitely never been the same since that happened. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, I never jumped around shoot after that again, either. Uh, um, but, um, yeah, definitely, definitely changed me. Um, physically and um, mentally sure. how do you think it how do you think it changed you we we just joked physically your runtime the stuff that you didn't do anymore how do you think it changed you mentally um part of it part of that goes to the physical aspect um i learned that i need to train smarter train my body smarter not harder um I had a, even after my injury, I had a proclivity to do extreme things just to, you know, just to do it. I mean, we're Marines, we're, we you know, we're not the smartest creatures, but, um, um, so that showed me, I need to train smarter. Um, and then, um, also, you know, uh, mentally, I saw what it was like to tiptoe on the abyss that a lot of guys find themselves at, um, when I was sitting home, uh, and, and how mentally fatiguing and how, uh, in shit shape really my mental state was, um, and realized that, you know, mental fitness is something that is very, very, very important. Um, so, um, taking care of myself, um, uh, physically and mentally, like became more of a priority. So you think you overlooked it for a long time? Absolutely. So absolutely. I want to go back to, and I'm so glad you said that because I want to go back to how you've talked about your career at every point of your career that we've talked about. You're like, it's excellent. Life is great. I'm, I'm doing what I want to do, blah, blah, blah. All of those things. And then you get there and you happen, this happens to you. 
And then you start thinking, well, my mental fitness isn't up as good as I thought it was. Obviously, at some point you weren't taking care of yourself in this awesome career and you're having so much fun. Where do you think that that line was? Because I'm really wondering, the accident happened, but you had lived a pretty much charmed career up till then. So where do you think that slip was? Was it right when that accident happened or was it way before it? No, I think definitely uh, before it. You know, like there is, there was a lot of great times, but there was a lot, definitely a lot of crappy times, you know, um, like one time me and my, our entire squad on my first point, we were down in the engine room, uh, dusting the engine room, which on a Navy ship probably doesn't even need to be done. It's like 140 degrees, 30, 20 degrees down there. Right. It's like crazy hot. And all because we got, we smarted off. And my squad leader was down there too, because the entire squad basically smarted off to the platoon sergeant. And the next thing we know, we're down the bottom of the engine room, right? So there's a lot of crappy times <laughs> that freaking happened. Um, you know, it wasn't all obviously sunshine and roses, and anybody's been in any branch of the military knows that. Um, but, um, you know, not, I think, you know, like when you look back on it, and there are, uh, especially like guys in my line of work um, or, you know, you, your line of work, right. Um, you become really good at compartmentalizing stuff. Um, and it's easier to just like, Hey, you like take this situation, bottle it up, right. Put it down somewhere and just put it in your brain somewhere and push it to the side um, until you know, that space is filled up with a lot of those incidences and, and you find yourself with way too much time to think uh, about and they start kind of like popping up like dang whack-a-mole, you know. Um, and now all of a sudden you realize that you start kind of going down that slope of, of, of unpackaging some of these things that some of these thoughts or incidents that have happened. Uh, that you've kept packaged up for a while. Now they start coming to the surface and it becomes a, you know, they start popping up more and more frequently. Um, so I wouldn't say that it was just, oh, bam, right at the accident is when my mental health was like that. I would say that um, there's a lot of stuff that um, started coming to the surface because I had nothing but time, nothing to do but uh, to, to think, you know. Um, and then, right, then a, a couple of that with the fear of the, of not ever being able to be a recon Marine again, right? Add that in there too. And now um, it's stuff start coming to the surface a lot, lot uh, more frequently. Well, I want to ask you a question. Did, did you think before all this happened, before you ever looked at the mental health, did you have anything else? You've said that, you know, you spent a lot of time at the job and stuff, but were there any hobbies? Did you like doing anything other than being a Marine? Um, so before the accident, uh, most of my free time was taken up with either going to see my kids um, or partying. My group of uh, buddies and stuff, like we would work hard and we'd play hard. So, and we didn't, you know, it's not like we had like all this downtime, but a lot of downtime that we did have um, was either was usually spent just partying. Um, so no real hobbies, um, so to speak. Um, and because, you know, after that accident was where I was like, all right, uh, I'm, I'm sitting home just feeling sorry for myself. Like I need to do something to um, get out of this funk. I right? got this dark place. And, um, I've always loved the outdoors. I hunted a little bit when I was a kid, uh, but not anything serious. Um, and so I ordered a bow off eBay and hobbled outside and started practicing with it and, um, started hobbling around the woods with a back brace and a cane and, uh, started like hunting. And, um, I just got that, like saved me. Um, <laughs> There's yeah, got outside. to be an urban legend of where you're at. Some guy in a back brace and a cane with a bow walking around. There's got to be a story out there now. Uh, a couple of my buddies, uh, this one piece of uh, this one patch of woods I used to hunt, which may or may not have been, I mean, 
it might have been questionable. Uh, a couple of my buddies like rolled <laughs> by me on the four wheelers one day, like stopped dead and saw me sitting under the tree, like did like a double take and like stopped and like, what are you doing? I'm like hunting deer. Get out, of, get out of here. You know, and they're like, uh, all right, see ya. You know, I took off. Um, but people definitely saw me come hobbling out of the woods like that. My son, he was like five at the time. So I dragged him with me and he usually just falls asleep. I could have shot a deer that year, but he woke up like, Hey, look, dad, a deer. I think gone. Um, I don't know how I was going to get out of the woods after I shot it. Um, so that'd been a whole nother conundrum, but, uh, the, the, I was trying, I was trying like a son of a gun. Um, so well, yeah, you, that's, you, go ahead. Yeah, that's, that's where that's, that's when, you know, um, I kind of got, that's, that's where, I mean, hunting, that's where I got into hunting big. Um, and you know, that part of that too, is I realized that, yeah, I do need to have a hobby being a Marine is a job, um, being a recon Marine is a job. Uh, but you know, when I'm off work, there's other things I can do with my time, uh, you know, to relax myself, you know? So well, I would think though, walking around hunting, especially as, you know, as slow as you were moving and stuff that that would bring even more thoughts that would give you even more time to think because you're trying to concentrate on maybe not the pain of the back brace and all that kind of stuff. So that makes you think even more. Did you find that to be a problem or did that help you really work through it? Um, the, you know, it helped me work through it. Um, cause there was times where I can sit down, you know, in nature under a tree and just not, and just shut my brain off and not think, you know, just enjoy the scenery, um, just enjoy nature and everything that comes with that. Um, and then there's other times that I could just, unpack things um in a more you know proper manner um i guess uh because there's no distractions out there um and you know nature just has a very calming and heal, uh, healing effect and ability to make you you know think clearly so you make it back though from this you you're promoted to staff sergeant um, you do 22nd Mew, Force Recon Platoon, your Operation Unified Protector, Operation Enduring Freedom. You even receive Force Recon Team Leader of the Year. So definitely, you didn't slow down when you got back. No, I did not. Um, yeah, after that, after, uh, after that deployment, we depl um, I was with Alpha Company, and we deployed to Afghanistan. Um uh, and then, yeah, after that, I went to force company and, um, did we did a, like a 10 and a half or 11 month Mew, um, when I was with force company. So, um, no, I definitely did not slow down at all. You think that was to prove something to yourself? This goes back to that question. Prove something to yourself, uh, I, I or prove something have, to everyone around you. I, I always have something to prove to myself. Um, uh, I think probably, actually, I don't think I know, um, the whole proving something to myself, um, uh, just comes from, uh, the way that I grew up and I'm probably not in a healthy, uh, version, uh, or in a, in a healthy manner anyway. Um, cause I just kind of grew up as the, we weren't, um, you know, like rich by any means we we're but we weren't like completely poor, but not well off, but everything I ever did growing up, uh, I had to work h harder than everyone else t to be good at or to, um, you know, make the team, right. Or uh, like basketball, like I played basketball every year from fifth grade till my senior year. And I probably only started a total of like 10 or 12 games, my entire basketball career. So I always like, you know, so always felt like I had to work harder to prove who I was, uh, or prove my worth, I guess. And, um, I was even harder on myself. Um, and then, uh, you know, especially at that time in my career as a recon force recon team leader, um, 
I need to prove to myself and to my men every day that I was worthy of being their team leader. You know, like we say, every day is a selection, uh, every meal is a feast. Um, but that's, you know, pretty much how I kind of was my mantra, really. Do you think that the thought ever creeped into your head that not you, but your men thought, mm, I don't know if he should be here with us. They were worried about liability or that the body would break down when it needed to be used the most. Or did that, ever, did that thought ever creep into your head or did you think I got this? Um, uh, no, I don't think that ever, uh, creeped in their head, um, or mine. Um, and not their head. I'm asking you if you thought oh, that, yeah. like if I, you, um, Oh man, my, because I, that, like I've had like, uh, four procedures on my left knee since that accident. Um, and I still need to have my patella tendon cut off and re to the bone. Um, I just, I'm not doing it and I've got a bunch of other stuff, um, wrong with me. Um, I like, uh, train, I, I, I PT and train my body, you know, to ensure that it would not break down. Um, yeah, I didn't feel if I ever, if I ever, I do know about, uh, you know, something about myself that if I did feel like, uh, my body, was going to break down or I was going to be a li liability in any way that I would have pulled myself off of a platoon in whatever way I needed to. Right. And, and, you know, the way that question, uh, maybe I didn't say it correctly. The way I was trying to put it out there was not that your guys actually thought that, but that could definitely creep into your own brain of man. Does everyone think that I'm legit to be here? And I mean, that could be a, a killer on a lot of people even if no one ever said, we don't think you should be here, but I, I, that would be the interesting part to me about you. And you always kind of try and prove to everyone else that you can be there. So I don't think that it was a problem about yourself, but I could definitely see you worrying about what the other people thought. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I didn't really, um, let it, that bothered me too much. That thought really didn't creep into my head that much because I like, again, took the training aspect of it, the physical training very seriously. Like I went and got my CrossFit level one, sir, my Olympic lifting, sir, did a lot of nutrition seminars. Um, and I was always, um, doing, um, like I would write, my guys PT programs. Uh, we were always, so I, I, I knew that I was not going to allow that to like creep into my brain. I was not going to allow my body to, to, to do that. Um, yeah, no, it just wasn't, I wasn't ready to let that be an option. For my after body. all these, de yeah. After all these deployments have happened, after you receive the war, uh, the award of force recon team leader of the year, you move over to the training group and now you're getting ready to be promoted to gunny. Um, so I'm wondering with you being lead instructor and you're stepping away from that world, you're not deploying, you're, you're teaching that next group. That's going to take the fight. Is it different for you now? Because you've seen everything you've seen combat, you've seen success in the Marines, you've seen injury, you've seen defeat, you've seen all these things. We've always talked about your leadership through this whole conversation. Do you take a different approach to your teaching, being the lead instructor, having known all the things that you knew by then, or do you still kind of bang away at how you've always been? Um, I definitely started off there banging away as I've always been. Um, and when I first got there, we had, um, or right after I first got there, we started in on all these curriculum reviews um, for all the courses that we taught. Um, and that was a opportunity, you know, for me and the other guys that I worked with to, um, you know, come together and improve all the programs, um, the shooting, the reconnaissance and surveillance and all that stuff. Um, so it was another 
task um, that we wanted to do um, well at and make um, impacting, you know, uh, changes that were, you know, because the, the changes we put in those curriculum reviews were going to impact, you know, the next couple of years of recon Marines uh, and snipers. Um, so it was another situation where um, I pretty much acted like myself. I, I don't say acted like myself, but uh, I didn't, my leadership ch uh, style didn't uh, change that much um, running uh, courses and whatnot um, in that billet. But when I went from being the lead to um, like the chief instructor, so to speak, um, it changed, it did change a little bit. Um, now the standard, right, is the standard. And I kind of looked at, uh, I looked at instructing, um, you know, as if the Marine Corps standard is here and my standard is here, I'm not going to, oh, there we go. Right. I'm not going to drop my standard, right? Coop standards here, Marine Corps standards here, right? I'm going to try to get the students to my standard. And if they fall just below that, right? Or even if they're at the Marine Corps standard, then it's still successful. Um, and, you know, we wanted to put out the most highly trained guys that we could. So it's kind of, I was never, I was never what they would call a stud hugger. Let me tell you that. <laughs> I was never a stud hugger. Uh, probably a bunch of guys would tell you that I made him run rescue, rescue Randy around the shoot house a whole bunch. Um, but, um, you know, definitely was, you got to maintain a standard and, and that's what we we're there to do. So, um, but I would yeah. think that, you you maintain you say you your standards here the marine corps is here and if they even fall below yours or to the marine corps level i would think after a while though a lot of people aren't going to live up to your standard because it's your standard and that could almost be maddening after a while um, you know trying to get people to that or are you okay with them hitting the Marine Corps standard, even when you have such high standards of yourself? Because I think that there would be a very hard delineation there. Yeah. Um, and that's like, I don't want to say just my standard, but like us as instructors, uh, standards, right. You know, like, and the Marine Corps got these like crazy high standards anyways, you know, they're like, uh, to pass a test that's 80 or above, you know, and, you go to a public school, 65 and above. And then the Marine Corps is like, but all Marines, they only get eighties or above on tests. They're like, well, it's a crazy little metric you guys got going on right there, but you guys, you know, go with that, you know? Um, and it's not, um, it, it is, it, it, it is a hundred. It is very maddening when you know that Marines are capable of, um, doing better than what you see them, uh, do, but, uh, as long as they met the recon standard, um, you know, I was satisfied with that. Not saying that, um, I, the, the whole, you know, what you just threw out the, uh, oh, it, it, that can be maddening. Absolutely. It's maddening. Um, very maddening, very maddening when you know, I, you, I think especially well, with someone like you, it could be very maddening. Oh, a hundred percent. <laughs> right. Like when you know, you just know, no, no, that, that, that they could perform better than that, what they're performing. It is super maddening. Um, or, you know, there's just guys that, um, they are cool being mediocre. That drives me nuts. Um, and in the Marine Corps, the mediocrity gets rewarded. Um, and there's guys who are just content to do the bare minimum and that, is all they want to do and they don't care that stuff drives me nuts but there's guys that are like that and you want to know what honestly the uh armed services needs guys like that right not everyone can be a chief we need indians um took me a long time to realize that um and it took me a long time to realize that like hey even though the marine corps wants everyone to be this you know superb leader um, and develop this leadership. Some guys just are not meant to be the leaders the way the Marine Corps wants, you know, um, go back to your Canadian guy. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was an endearing bugger, though. I'm telling you right now, man. That dude loved that machine gun. I'm telling you, like, it just, you just can't, you can't make that stuff up. But. <laughs> And that's going to, uh, that's going to live rent free in my head forever. Just trying to figure out what he spent $150,000 on. And we're talking, this is, this is, you know, 2002, right? That's like, that's like $350,000 these days. <laughs> what was Fraser doing? I don't know. I'm never going to know. He wasn't even from the United States. That, that would have been my first question. I would have to know what he bought. And then the first art gives me the impossible task of figuring out why he was in debt that much. What do you want? Like, do you, this is not how this works, first art. Like, yeah, Roger that first art. I'll figure it out. You know, like, <laughs> what do you want me to do? I'm only one I, man here. <laughs> I want to talk about one more assignment that you had uh, being assigned to the Wounded Warrior Battalion East. Um, I'll give a brief example. It's a regiment that provides leadership and ensures compliance with the laws of the Department of Defense regulations related to the support, recovery, and non-medical care of combat and non-combat wounded, ill, and injured Marines, sailors attached to Marines unit, and their family members in order to maximize their recovery as they return to duty or transition to civilian life. I bring this one up because... I want to go back to the very beginning when we talked about it, and they said, sign this piece of paper that you don't have it or you're not going home. You see full circle in your career of working in something like that. Tell me what it means to work in something like that after the very first thing you experienced during the invasion. Uh, wounded, uh, you know, Wounded War Battalion actually was... Um certain aspects of it were rough for me. Um, and yeah, that, that piece of paper, um, you know, that post invasion, um, and then even after my accident, cause they wanted to medically retire me after my accident. And, um, I was a weird case because I had all civilian doctors since my accident, so I was taken care of in 29 Palm, or in, uh, Palm Regional out in uh, Palm Springs, and then uh, transferred care to my doctor in New York. Um, I was in this weird place. Um, they wanted me on a med board because um, Wounded War Battalion was just kind of starting to be a thing back then, but I wasn't attached to them. And I literally had uh, the orthopedic surgeon, the Navy doctor that they assigned to me, I caught that dude coming out of surgery one day and had him sign me back to full duty. And he didn't, that guy never even met me before. Like true story. Like I was on, I was on limited duty in the Navy in this, in the MERS system for eight years before they took me off it. It was just back then. That's how that would happen. And so, and even so, so when they started wounded warrior battalion, right. Where they didn't have their stuff together. Um, and then, like, I fell through the cracks. So they wanted to medically retire me back then um, to when I got there. Um, and even to now, I did a symposium with them uh, last week. Uh, they had their charitable org symposium, and I attended that. Um, and it's a, um, like I said, it was, it was at times difficult for me there because it is the only unit in the whole United States Marine Corps whose sole mission is to help Marines uh, and sailors either recover and return to active duty or, you know, transition out. That's it. That's their only job. Um, and so when I got there, um, I basically had the, like, hey, I'll do my medical appointments. I'll do my uh, PT. But other than that, I want you to leave me alone. Um, don't mess with me. I don't want to be involved in all of the other folks, all of whatever they got going on, I don't want to be involved in all that stuff. Um, um, just because it was a weird place for me um, to be. Um, and uh, um, the good thing is that it's in place, the, they have the, all those programs in place for the right reasons to take care of service members. 
Um, and there's people there that genuinely need help. Um, and all of the, all of the resources that Marines need, um, is there for them, whether they're, whether it's physical or mental, um, illness. So that I think is spectacular. Well, I, I think it's interesting though, with what you do now with the, the charitable organization that you run now, it's, it's getting to the same thing. It's using a different means, but it's doing the same thing. Yeah. I, I almost wonder how many people you could have helped if you would have just maybe opened up your eyes a little bit back then. So back then I actually was helping out another organization, uh, called combat Marine outdoors. And I was, okay. uh, uh, I was sending Marines and sailors, uh, army guys, whoever to them to go do hunts. Um, uh, and then there was a bunch of local hunts here. Um, so I was friends with the, the game wardens on base, um, and a, a local Colonel, a retired Colonel, he would do a hunt every year and a couple other folks would do hunts. So I would send guys to that. So uh, even though I didn't have my own organization, I was still helping other organizations do that. Um, had I had my own organization back then, I definitely could have, um, if I would started it back then and, and me and my uh, buddy, Tony had talked about it right after I first retired, but, um, the timing wasn't right. But if I was doing it back then, it definitely, um, would have taken off, you know? Um, well, let's so. talk about it and let's talk about what you do and, and the yeah. support that you're providing these days. So let's, you know, let's talk about the reason outdoors. Yeah. So, um, 501 C three, um, and we take veterans and first responders and their kids hunting and fishing, uh, and on outdoor activities, we call it ecotherapy. That's our, um, um, uh, tagline, I guess, um, ecotherapy, um, helps that helps us with, um, dealing with folks that may not want to hear hunting and fishing and you know, veterans and first responders all in the same sense because they start thinking about guns and, you know, things of that nature. But if I say ecotherapy, it helps some of those folks uh, digest it a little better. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I mean, but we're going hunting, you know, we're going fishing. We, we want to bring guys and gals together. Um, service members, uh, you know, police, firefighters, EMS, right? Bring those folks together, get them in the outdoors, uh, in nature, uh, hopefully get them to harvest uh, an animal uh, or catch a fish, um, and then teach them how to, you know, if they've never hunted before, teach them the hows, the whys, why we do it. When they harvest something, teach them how to clean it, cook it, uh, skin gut, quarter it or what have you, um, and just give them the, the full experience. Um, you know, some folks never hunted and want to, some people never had the opportunity to. So, um, we love having those kind of people. I think a class that you ought to teach is how to get a deer out of the woods. If you're in a back brace, I think that should be definitely one. You, <laughs> yeah. When you focus in on this, Right. Let's talk about not only that, let's talk about hunting Carolinas um, and just what you're doing, because I think this goes back to the whole thing. You have the 501 C three, you're, you're helping out there, but we talked about before where you're in the Marines and that's your whole life. You don't really have a hobby. And I don't know necessarily that this is a hobby, but you definitely have focus in other avenues and other things to do with your time. So can we talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Uh, so for hunting Carolinas, um, yeah, since I retired, uh, I worked for an outfitter. I had another uh, guide service that was a full-time one um, that I sold to my business partner. And uh, Hunting Carolinas really is my hunting journey um, and adventures. Um, I do guide uh, some hog hunts, deer hunts, uh, bear hunts, um, and I and coyote hunts. And I do a lot of, uh, I got some predator eradication contracts, um, uh, for some local neighborhoods and farmers and stuff here in Eastern North Carolina. So hunting Carolinas is just all of that, um, wrapped up into one, um, a lot of, 
you know, me hunting or me and some friends hunting, but also, you know, clients shooting hogs, um, deer, um, you know, whomever, however, uh, have guns will travel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I hunt usually once or twice, one or two nights a week almost, uh, or more at times depends on how, how much my wife wants to beat me to death. Um, but, uh, I think right now we're, <laughs> we're at, uh, I think we're at 85 or six coyotes this year. Last year we ended up with 150. Um, I don't know if we'll make it to, yeah, I think we can do that by December, but, um, of course, yeah. So we got a, we got a, um, all that. That's what I do at hunt Carolinas. All right. Let's talk about where people can find you. This is social media, uh, going through the 501 C three, the hunting Carolinas where they can find you everywhere that they could possibly find you. Let's talk about that now. All right. Everywhere you can possibly find me, uh, hunting Carolinas, uh, on Instagram, it's all gotta be one word. Um, you gotta do the at symbol too. And then uh, at hunting Carolina is all one word cause I'm shadow banned and therefore they, uh, it won't pop up unless you do that. Or you can find me at the underscore reason underscore outdoors underscore on Instagram. The reason outdoors on Facebook, hunting Carolina is on Facebook, hunting Carolinas.com or, uh, the reason outdoors.org. Um, you can find me at all those places, um, and shoot me a DM smoke signal carrier pigeon, however your preferred method of communication is these days. I don't discriminate. <laughs> I, I suggest it to people. I will say you're a very hard guy to get a hold of though. It, it takes a while to get the response back. I, I had trouble doing it. I, I spent some time doing it. Oh, getting a hold of me. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that's because, uh, look, I'm a Marine, you know, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, and I think that your message was sitting in my general or, um, the request messages for a while. And I was like, oh dude, that just makes me feel like a a heel. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm sorry. (laughs) You know what? All is forgiven. All right, guys, you know where you can find Ryan. Uh, Let's talk about where you can find me. As always, you can find me on Instagram, the DTD underscore podcast. You can find me on Facebook at the DTD podcast. And you can find me on YouTube where all these conversations, they're in video form. But your one-stop shop, dtdpodcast.net. That's going to be everything you need. It's got audio, video. Ryan has his own page there whenever this show comes out. He's going to have it there with pictures when he finally sends them to me. It's going to have his bio. It's going to have his links. It's going to have everything that you can possibly need to know about him and get an even deeper look into his life and his story. So make sure you go there, dtdpodcast.net. Make sure you like it. Make sure you join the mailing list, all those different things. Remember, guys, be a friend, tell a friend, share, like, subscribe, do all of those things you know help the show grow. Don't forget to also visit the guys that make this show possible. Tridentcoffee.com, and that's DTD15. We'll get you 15% off your order. Maxbelts.com. You know they're the toughest belts on the planet. My buddy Mac Alexander over there is killing it. If you want one for wear, whether nice, whether the range, whatever you want, he's got it taken care of. And hatchetbrewing.com, I'm going to hook up with those guys in North Carolina later on this week. We've got some stuff coming up from them. Make sure you check them out there. All their swag, hats, cups, anything that you could possibly think, hoodies, it's all there. Don't forget to check all three of those sponsors out. Really help them because they help the show. Guys, that's going to be it for this week. I am so honored that you came on the show that we got this to happen today. I was a little worried that it wasn't going to, but we made it happen. Guys, that's Ryan. I'm DJ. This has been the show. Catch us on the next one. See you later.